So the part of the story we rarely tell is that there's a young girl, maybe 13, 14, running, panting, she's out of breath, her brow is sweaty, and she's trying to make her way with adrenaline pumping through her veins through the tiny, dirty streets of a poor neighborhood. Maybe she's on the way to her friend's house to share with them some incredibly stressful news. She's pregnant. We know that she's young in the story, not just because of her features or frame, but because we're told that she's not married. She is engaged to a man, and she lives in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is in what is today called the West Bank. It was a small town at the time, smaller even than it is today, so small, in fact, that there were probably, studies suggest, only 20 infant boys in a village of that size at the time. So this unwed, pregnant girl will be noticed. This is the setting in which the traditional Christian framework posits that the holy was made known in the world. We don't have a lot about these stories, really, for all the focus on Christmas in the culture. We don't have all too much in the stories of the Christian tradition about this. Both John and Mark's gospels start off with Jesus as an adult. Matthew has a page or so about it in his version, and it's Luke who gives us a little bit more material, a tired, weary family traveling for the purpose of a Roman census. Not enough room at the inn as it goes, and so Mary gives birth to her child in a dirty stable with the child's adopted father, Joseph, nearby. This is a story that you know already, and it is a story that will absolutely fill the next four weeks. In our culture, it will be here. In our church, it will be in songs in the grocery store and the mall and the radio, and it'll be on the television. For many of you, I know whether you like it or not. <laughs> whether there is mystery left in this story for you. But we're entering the season anyway. And into this complex story of light in the midst of darkness, and we will ask you a question which is not rhetorical. Where do you think hope is being birthed into the world? In the coming weeks, love and tenderness will be juxtaposed with hurry and consumption massive consumption. Americans will spend $450 billion on Christmas, and it would cost us $20 billion to provide clean water to every human being living on the planet. Our spiritual task, I think, is to ask every year when we approach this story, what truth and challenge does it ask of our lives? So what stands out to me is not that this story includes fantastic, supernatural, mythic elements. These were very common to the stories of the time when this was written, especially for birth narratives of important, revered teachers. The astounding thing that's included in this story is that it's a very human story. Unwed pregnant girl is scared because she knows how she will be seen in her community. She is only engaged to a man in a small town. They're living in occupied territory under the power of empire. They've been ordered for a census. They're a human family dealing with difficult circumstances. And in this version of the story, the messenger of God shows up to an unwed teenage pregnant girl and says, I see you. God sees you. And in fact, God is being born in you. He doesn't say this to anybody. He says this to a person and a family who would otherwise have been invisible, worthless to the powers that be. Let us not forget what a revolutionary claim this is, the inherent 
worth, and dignity of every human being. In the season with the lights shining and twinkling in the trees, I think that this story is calling me and perhaps us to ask, are we willing to practice seeing one another? Really seeing one another. Now this is the beginning of Advent this year, but I have to tell you that for me, I think my 2011 Advent started in June last year. I found out I was going to be a dad on Father's Day. I can remember that moment of that particular annunciation <laughs> very concretely. We were traveling too that week. I don't want to make the parallels too strong. We were traveling, and I remember my wife kind of whispering from another room, a room off the kitchen in her parents' house where we were staying that weekend, that I needed to come in. She had something to tell me. And there it began. You did not have to convince me last year that there was some truth to be found in the Advent story. The notion that there was something of the holy to be experienced in awaiting the birth of a child made total sense to me last year. With my wife six months pregnant at Christmas, while we're feeling our baby move, while we sang carols and went to visit family, it made sense. I didn't need to be convinced. But something else funny happened. So Kate and I had had this ongoing conversation for the last couple of years where I would say to her every few months, you know, for all the babies being born in the world, there just aren't that many pregnant women around. <laughs> and every, every time I said this to her, she would assure me that in fact there were pregnant women all around. I just wasn't noticing them. And the minute when I found out that my wife was pregnant, I saw this everywhere in the supermarket, at the park, at the movies, at church. I came up to Kate and I said, I see pregnant people. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was like there was this part of being alive and this, this fundamental part of human life that I simply had not seen. And now it was visible everywhere I looked. Now this is a, a small and you know, kind of funny example from my life, but what it pointed out to me was just how easy it is for a part of someone else's humanity, an important part, to remain invisible to me. Unseen. How easy it is for us to walk by other human beings and simply not notice the fact that they are there. This is, of course, not just my story. Not just a Christmas story either. In the summer, Daniel told us a story from the pulpit that I think has stuck with this congregation in a few ways because I've heard this refrain said a couple of times. Daniel told us a story in the summer about an activist working uh, with undocumented immigrants and a time when she was put in jail with them and looked across into the cell in front of her and said to a woman through the bars, I see you. I love you. Si se puede. Yes, it's possible. A few months ago, a member of our church, Melissa Rosales, stood in this pulpit introducing our theme year, and she said to us that she thought our focus for a year on service and engagement was a way of practicing saying, I see you, to the human beings that we encounter in our lives how easy it is for human beings to be invisible to us. We turn our head down, we literally cross the street, we take a particular route to work or avoid particular neighborhoods, turn off the TV or shut the book so that we might avoid the experience of poverty or pain. Differences of opinion in politics, religion, or even parenting styles can easily turn people who look like friends and neighbors into walking collections of ideas I disagree with. Not human beings. 
I notice myself hurrying from one place to another, feeling chronically late, and forgetting that the cars surrounding me on Preston and 635 are actually filled with humans. That they are not just mobile devices for obscuring my path. And of course, nothing tends to make the humanity of those before us dissipate like our anger and chronic dissatisfaction with their imperfection. The humanity of a coworker is shrouded in late emails or a project gone awry. A family member seems less of a family member because there they go again. All of us travelers each of us carrying and giving birth to something holy and yet so easily invisible to each other. That story of the woman Nancy in the diner that we heard this morning was hard for me to read. I had to practice it a lot, so I made it all the way through this Sunday. And I think the reason was because it's so familiar to me. I don't want to admit that, but it's so familiar to me. I know that guy. I've seen him a thousand times. And a thousand times I've done the exact same thing. I've tried as hard as I could not to engage, not to even see him. Turning my back, closing my eyes, sometimes with a baby in my arms. She said my eyes couldn't take it in all at once. This family on a Sunday Christmas day is already weary in the middle of a road trip trying to get back so that they can work the day after Christmas and they plop themselves into a crowded booth in what she calls a sleazy roadside diner with this assorted cast of characters, the people who have found themselves in a sleazy roadside diner on Christmas. Her son falls in love with a man she wants to ignore. A tattered rag of a coat toes that poked out of would-be shoes. She says, I wasn't close enough to smell him, but I knew. She wants to ignore them, and all the while, her one-year-old son is chanting, pounding his hands on the table, hi there, hi there, hi there. And the old man that she does not want to see turns to her baby and literally says, hi there, Buster, I see you. She's embarrassed and annoyed. She turns the high chair around so that her son cannot look at the man and he refuses, twisting and contorting his body as infants are wont to do. She rushes to leave with the man between her and the door, praying, Lord, let him not talk to me. And as she says, the Lord and her son have different plans. She talks about meeting the man eye to eye. Would you let me hold your baby? Without the time to answer, her baby leaps into the arms of a man she did not want to know, let alone give her child to. And I felt that kind of awkward, pit-of-my-stomach guilt when I read the story. The baby's head on his shoulder, his dirty hands holding her child and rocking him, crying through closed eyes, thanking her for the gift. Through her own tears, she runs to the car and says, My God, my God, forgive me. I have uttered those words and felt that exact same feeling, baby in my arms or not. We don't always miss the humanity of another being so concretely, but we sometimes do. And what a nativity scene that was. The weary travelers, the family on the road trip with the infant child, with the cast of characters mismatched. The holy challenge showing up where it should have been invisible saying, I see you. My message to you this Sunday is not unique at all. It's something you've heard a hundred times so easy for us to miss the fact that the containers, the vessels moving around us are humans with complex, interior, holy, precious lives. 
And so I invite you this Advent to join with me in a practice of picking one person in your life who it's really hard to see right now. One person whose full humanity it is very hard for you to see. The kind of person where it would be easier for you to say you believe that God was born to a virgin in a stable 2,000 years ago than it would be to admit that, that there is something good and precious and holy in them. Perhaps you will join me in the practice of waking up every morning and bringing this person to mind and whether they hear it or not, saying, I see you. You know the drill. The next few weeks will be full. But these can be very human times if we let them be. So Merry Christmas in advance, my friends. May the holy be evident in all you do. Amen.